So, um, Bruce, I'd like to talk about another aspect that th this is where I have a reservation. And um, it, part of it is, again, not optimizing for one fight. And it will be inevitable that um, the Marine, Marine Corps in the future will find itself on the ground somewhere where it's got to deal up close and personal with, you know, some kind of, you know, pillbox, urban, you know, reinforced, um, whatever, where a tank is going to come in very handy. Uh, but the other aspect that we haven't talked about is the psychological impact of, of tanks and armor in particular. Um, when I was in the 15th Mu, we were preparing, we were preparing for a deployment to the Middle East. And, uh, you know, I had the luxury, I was not going on the deployment. I had been already been, uh, my relief was in place. And my job was to kind of look at scenarios and places. And one of the places we looked at was Somalia, and this is 1992. Um, we had done an evacuation, but the place was going to hell, and there was probably a pretty good possibility we thought that you know might have to go there. And our MU was in the they had, they had there was a real shipping problem, so shipping had been cut, and the MU was trying to decide you know what to do without, and a big debate about tanks. And, you know, because the tanks take up a lot of space and in the Marine Corps, space and weight is really, really important. And ultimately, um, you know, I argue, I was arguing that we should bring the tanks, not because of just because of the firepower, but because of the psychological impact they would make. And what I had, adv what I was advising the MU commander was, ended up was Greg Newbold was, if you go ashore in Somalia, you need to go big and you need to go heavy and you need to go loud because in Somalia it's about clans and it's about tribes and you're going to be looked at as a new clan and a new tribe and so you need to make a big impression and that big impression is flying harriers and cobras low and loud over the city um, and driving big ugly loud and impressive vehicles through the city um, and ultimately the MU didn't do it but the follow-on marine forces did um, they brought tanks off of one of these maritime prepositioning ships, and they ended up using them in the city. Um, ironically, because of the way the ships were loaded, they actually went ashore and drove them when they didn't have ammunition for their main guns. So they were they they had ammunition for the uh, the machine guns, but they didn't have main tank ammo at least initially when they were doing this. Uh, but they made a big impression. They there are if you I you know looked at looked up the history of Marine Ops in Somalia before we had this discussion. And, and they were used effectively, again, more for the psychological impact than, than actually the firepower. And, and I'm, I worry that um, given the importance of this, you know, what we're calling now this cognitive domain, um, sometimes, you know, tanks have an impact beyond simply what comes out of the main gun. Yeah, yeah well said, Bill. So, you know, I was thinking um, if there's a way to mitigate this and not have the costs, you know, historically, um, the Marine Corps has been good at leveraging um, the Army's assets. You know, like we're pretty good at like taking your leave behinds. And a good example is when second tanks deployed uh, during Desert Storm, they didn't take, they didn't have, we had M60s back then. And so you had trained on M60s, but you fell in on uh, the old M1A1 heavies. So the heavy variant that their Army was going to best itself of. We're like, okay, we'll take these, and then eventually came back to the U.S. and got their actual um, uh, M1A ones for for service deployment, and also, uh, you know, second tanks. And I would imagine, for, and I know first tanks as well, really made a lot of use of virtual training. You know, through the uh, late '80s and the early '90s, and you know, yeah, you did tank operations, but you did a lot of work in SimNet at Fort Knox to actually get battalion level and company level exercises in. Uh, you were using. Um, I feel terrible. I have forgotten the name of our gunnery simulation that we used. Um, but again, like virtual training was a huge part of it. And I wonder to what degree the Marine Corps could possibly consider keeping um, reservists who don't have tanks, but who say use army assets and use virtual training to keep the capability alive uh, for when they need it. I don't know if that's been a war gamed out or if that's possible, but I can imagine the institutional capacity and the knowledge being maintained without all of the, the tail and the expense. Yeah, so are we are we actually saying that there's uh, there's room for keeping a company, at least, say redundancy for other missions, 
could we keep a company in the Marine Corps at the active component? I think the first thing to look at is, you know, what will the near time, near term Marine mission be? I mean, just because this force transformation is happening, are they going to stop the historical mission of being able to project immediate power from the sea? Uh, you know, like the, you're talking about Somalia, uh, anytime any sort of coastal region has issues, we have a Marine Mew parked off the coast ready to go if need be uh, to protect our assets. Will that change anytime soon, personally? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and so I think that has to be looked at because is one company enough then? Because, you know, we're talking about how there are still three Marine tank battalions, but the reality is when you look at their tables organization, they're not even full-powered battalions. Uh, none of them are at full strength. And from what I've talked to and from what I've seen on, on their deployment cycles, uh, both their equipment and manpower has been extremely taxed because they can't really uh, – maintain uh, the generation cycle much like the Army has gone to. And that's a, that's a fight the Army has been dealing with for years, especially when we went from Iraq. We had to increase our armor brigade so we could actually maintain a proper amount of deployments while also giving the brigade back in the state's time to rebuild that power, uh, both equipment and manpower. Uh, that, that, that's, that's almost going to be its own analysis, is if they do cut down, what, what is enough? Yeah. I I don't know, Rob. I'm I'm not sure that that most of the Mews, if any, are going out with tanks right now. Um, the you know the 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 number of amphibious ships and so forth. Um, the light armored vehicles are actually a lot yep. more useful for those kinds of applications. Um, I don't think a company provides you know critical mass, both you know either for employment or um, sustainability. I think uh, I think an intermediate course um, would be a one active duty battalion and one reserve battalion, um, with the active duty battalion stationed at 29 Palms. Um, mm -hmm. The force design may, you know, if if at the end of this, and and you know, General Berger's kind of been very clear that that you know his what he's released is an initial cut, and that there's a lot more work to be done. Um, it could. It could be that you end up with um, a more heavy and conventional force element um, that stays in the force, and that would be at, at 29 Palms as it's traditionally been. Um, and that's sort of your in emergency break glass, and then you know you send that um, backed up by a, a reserve battalion, which I think would be legitimate. That would you probably need at least one active in order to sustain one reserve and that would that would give you some uh capability and and sort of a hedge if you will um again though i i you know it, it's at this point i think as as you know general Berger's looking down the road for the reasons we've discussed both the economics and the um kind of uncertainty or the you know where does a tank fit in this force design um, I, I think he had to, you know, he's, he's faced tough choices, and right now it just, the, the tank doesn't fit um, either economically or from a, a force employment. So trying to save, you know, a half or a third of the force probably doesn't make sense at this point. Mm -hmm. So um, an alternative contingency, perhaps, is if, so let's assume we get rid of all Marine Corps tanks, now we're going to rely on the Army. Does that imply that the Army has to specialize, let's say, at least one of its battalion in an amphibious role? Because let's not forget the Marine Corps tanks are actually they're configured slightly different than the Army's tanks in order to achieve uh, ship-to-shore landings, and they routinely train these ship-to-shore landings. So. Does that imply that the Army has to specialize at least one battalion for the amphibious role? Um, that may be, go ahead, Bill. Well, I'll say that, that may be a hard ask, too, because, you know, one of the things that the Army is facing right now is that at the same time that they're being called upon to be ready to function within the indo pacom region, they've also invested themselves of all of their amphibious boats and capability of doing things amphibiously. So there's just kind of a weird a disconnect between what the Army is optimizing for and sort of what they're being asked to do on the national defense strategy side to be able to function in that, in that region. They're also, you know, asking too about multi-domain operations, and that's not quite as clear Was the, like, the Marine Corps has gone to the MiGs and is thinking about that. So the, the, the Army might need to, and it might make sense, 
I'm not sure that the Army's institutional priorities lie that way, though. And so that could be a fight. Yeah. Yeah, un, un, yeah and unfortunately, right now, um, I, I think all the services are going through a similar thought process about how what they need and how they can contribute to a, a future fight out looking out to 2030. Um, but they're doing it, you know, in a silo. Um, and so the Army's thinking about the Army and the Navy, the Navy. And, you know, that was one of General Berger's big points is, hey, you know, Navy and Marine Corps have got to get back together so that they are thinking together. And we're starting to see some signs, but, um, you know, Navy and Marine Corps have, have kind of had a, not a divorce, but let's call it a, a mutual separation for the past 15 years. And so what what we're seeing, and you know, Rand does a lot of work for the Army and the Air Force, and and I don't think Bill and I participate heavily in that, but we, you know, we see enough to to understand that the Army is going to do what the Army is going to do for in what's good for the Army, and um, as much as it, it, you know, would mix, we would I think from a Marine Corps perspective, we'd certainly like to have the Army designate a unit that would you know work with the Marine Corps on a, on a regular basis in training and exercises. Um, like Bill says, I think, I think that's a hard sell. Um, I wouldn't, I, I don't think I would make overemphasize the, the, the amphibious training part of it though. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the tanks need to be able to drive on to and drive off of a landing craft. Um, and get used to a little bit of different dynamics of living on a ship for however long that that takes in, in transit. Um, I don't want to minimize that, uh, or I, I don't want to minimize it, but at the same time, I don't think you should make too much of it. Um, the hard part of amphibious operations is the synchronization of ship to shore movements, the surface landing, and the you know the the, the helicopter, the aviation insert, and all the supporting arms individual elements just kind of, you know, hey, my number's up, go down to the well deck, get in the boat and drive, or go up to the flight deck, get on a helicopter and, and go. Um, so I, I don't I don't think that is an obstacle per se. Um, and, and, you know, as far, I, I'm sure you're right, there are some different configurations between, you know, Marine and Army tanks based on, on that. But, um, you know, essentially what what would you know what the tanks would be asked to do in transit is is not more not a lot more than would be for a, a long river crossing you know i mean the, the marine corps tanks are configured configured to wade to a much uh, deeper depth than than army tanks and i, and I you, you can imagine this we know historical examples of this where where the, you know, the capacity is just forgotten so, so <laughs> when you're suddenly at short notice, you're suddenly called to, to, to wade out of the surf and then people are looking for the equipment to make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's not technically difficult, but it's just not available. So. Although I, I think, I think at least, you know, at least when, when, you know, when I was in the muse, most of the time we put the tanks on the, on the air cushion vehicles that, that could right up to the shore as opposed to the, the LCUs where that wading might be more of an issue. Yeah. I don't think marine tankers are particularly thrilled about waiting either. <laughs> right. Forwarding kits work a lot better in theory than they work in practice. <laughs> Always. Yeah. <laughs> so, gentlemen, uh, what else do we need to say about this issue? What are the dimensions we might be missing? Um, what are the dimensions of uh, the operation that we are optimizing for and perhaps dimensions of operations that we are uh, optimizing against? So, so I think that, um, you know, you asked earlier about the sort of idea of, you know, I, I don't know if you used the word, but you were getting at like robust versus brittle decision making, right? Like, are we going to put too many chips in one place? And uh, so Rand actually has a methodology called robust decision making, right? And what it does is, instead of trying to make a really good guess about the future, right? Like, I'm really, really sure the Germans can't go through the Ardennes. I'm really, really convinced of it. It's just too many trees. It's not going to happen. I am 95% sure. So I'm going to optimize for another future. And I'm like, oh, oops, <laughs> I made the wrong guess. So the idea is that in, re in place of trying to guess the future, which if you're wrong, can be catastrophically wrong and be a very brittle choice, 
what you're trying to do is sort of overlay different futures and ask wh what, what solutions are optimized or cover the most area under the curve for different futures, right? We apply this broadly. And so I, what I do think, and, and JD made this point earlier, is it's not done yet. This is not final, right? We have, we have a, a strategic vision. We have a direction we're going in. There's going to be a lot of wargaming about this. We're going to be wargaming this. We're going to be doing, you know, exercises on this. And so I, I think what you asked was the right question is, as we go forward, as we war game, as we debate, as there's been sort of really healthy back and forth public discussion, is to ask, okay, how do we make the most robust decision possible so that we can uh, prepare for a lot of different climbs and places, right? And I think, uh, JD, you're right. Like, whatever we think is going to happen at some place in some time, we'll be doing something we didn't think we're going to be doing, and we'll be faced with like an urban challenge, pillboxes, armor on armor. So we got to be ready for that. And I think that is in the process. It's not today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I expressed it as reserving capacity against unforeseen contingencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I put it this way and, and it, I, I wasn't really thinking about the tank issue at the time, but um, one of the benefits of be having been around for a while is you've seen a lot of things and um, you know, the Marine Corps coming out of Vietnam, uh, there was a similar, for both the Army and the Marine Corps, we, you know, what, what should we really be doing? And the Army properly reoriented itself on Europe and the air land battle and how do we defeat the, you know, the Soviets and, and the technology that came out of the Arab-Israeli war. Um, and that has became as a primary focus and the Marine Corps, you know, if we're going to be part of the defense establishment, we better show we can contribute to that. And so the Marine Corps have eat up and opened up 29 palms and added a tank battalion and more AABs and, and more artillery to be able to show we could contribute, the Marine Corps could contribute in that fight. But at the same time, it understood that most of what it was going to be doing was not that and that it had to remain flexible and adaptable. And I would argue that the Marine Corps' contributions to national security in the 70s and the 80s, you know, was not what was happening at 29 Palms, it was innovations like maneuver warfare and the, you know, the Marine Expeditionary Unit Special Operations Capable, um, things that provided a lot more flexibility, maritime prepositioned shipping um, to, to get stuff to the Middle East in a hurry. All those kinds of innovations and, and thinking creatively and, and being able to do a lot of different things, I think is a, is a, is a contribution of the Marine Corps to, to national security. And, you know, some of us who've been around and, you know, are just a little worried about this, about over-optimization, like Bill said, against, against one thing. Um, Mark Kantzian, who I work with at Quantico, has, has made this point publicly. And so, again, not specifically to the tank issue, but I, I do think there, you know, as Bill said, there has to be some caution and, and you know, there still needs to be that flexibility built into the force. And, and let's be fair, Berger, you know, makes that point. He says very clearly, while we're focused on that, that primary threat, we have to be able to do other things. And he didn't cut out you know, 50% of the infantry battalions, he cut a couple of them and he's reducing their size. So the core of the Marine Corps is still, you know, still at least right now built around infantry um, in, in our roots. So I, I think that flexibility is there just, you know, I, he has to play to the national defense strategy and, and um, you know, make sure that the Marine Corps is showing it, it can make a contribution in that arena as well. And the tank just kind of doesn't fit right now in that paradigm. Right, well, final thoughts, gentlemen? Anything that we haven't covered that we should have done? Uh, I'd actually be interested as a historian point of view. There's actually a lot of discussion uh, with my compatriots looking at how the Marines are looking at the, uh, the 2030 fight. And there's actually been in some academic circles where they've compared this to the uh, Marine Corps in the 1930s, uh, the strategy before World War II as far as how we plan to defend the Pacific. And of course, given how that turned out, there's been some discussion if that, you know, if that's a good correlation or if, you know, if this kind of is foreboding on this strategy or not. So I'd be interested in everyone else's opinion on that, uh, you know, where it was more focused on holding island strongholds, coastal artillery, which some have made correlation uh, to the long range missiles. That's, you know, the same concept that we, we were relying on long range artillery and battleships 
uh, while marine detachments were supposed to hold islands, whether or not, you know, if, is that a good correlation or are we, or are we, you know, just bark up the wrong tree with that? I think that's a very apt comparison. And, you know, we had a time building up to World War II where, you know, Pete Ellis and, and lots of people in, in the Marine Corps were looking out and saying, uh, things have changed. And on the one hand, there's going to be this sort of like really intense tactical battle to seize these little footholds to get towards, you know, the potential enemy in Japan. But also this understanding that, you know, what part of our strategy is skipping around strategically. We don't need to grab every piece of land. It's the critical pieces we need to string together a logistical train, chain that allows us to project force going forward. I see the same something analogous happening here where we're asking ourselves, okay, how do we retain toeholds and or deny access toeholds in the first and second island chain against this peer competition. So I think it's a very apt comparison. Okay, no, I yeah. appreciate that. I, I do too, but there's one exception um, that the, the, the World War II amphibious operations were intended to you know, forcibly seize islands and terrain in order to provide bases and stations for the Navy and, and, and the air components to operate off of. In this case, not actually, you know, most of it, although this part is a little bit fuzzy, but, but most of the thinking right now is that these, you know, these expeditionary bases are going to be on the territory of, of allies and partners. And so forcible entry is not a big part of the equation. And the effects are not, I mean, there is a, there is a, um, there is a flavor where you're providing um, forward arming and refueling points for aircraft and potentially even naval vessels. But we're also talking about applying direct effects against, against naval and air targets, which wasn't a big part of the World War II thing. It was more give a base for the Navy so they can go do that. In this case, we're trying, they're trying to equip the Marine Corps to actually reach out and touch you know, frigates and, and high value aircraft and things like that. And then, you know, the project work where I've you know, been working with the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, I've kind of described it as really turning, you know, having to turn the orientation of the Marine Corps 180 degrees. So whereas right now and, and going all the way back to World War II, the emphasis was on ground combat, locate, close with, and destroy the enemy. So you seize, a, you seize ground that can then be used for other things. In this case, the combat is against naval and air forces, and the Marine Corps, instead of fo looking focused landwards, turning 180 degrees, it's going to be on land looking out into the air and maritime domains and trying to provide effects that way, whether it's from missiles or swarms of unmanned systems or kind of the stuff that Bill works in, the, you know, the information domain electronic warfare and cyber effects and messaging, um, all of those kinds of things. So it, it, that part, it, I think, is, is, is radically different than, than kind of what came out of the 30s. Same concept, support a naval campaign, but different in the way that you do it. So, J.D., I think the similarity here is not in the particulars, like you said, but rather that the Marine Corps had to think creatively. How is the world changing? How is yep. warfare changing? How do we then do something that actually fits the, you know, the, the coming threat? Yep, absolutely. Again, that creativity, I think, is a, you know, is a, is a strength of the Marine Corps. And I, I keep thinking there's a longer, even, even longer historical cycle here, which is that uh, states, particularly democracies, they, in peacetime, they like to go light. So they'd like to lighten their forces. And economics is a lot behind this. So you can even go back to the 1920s where you know, democracies particularly, they were going towards tankettes and light tanks, and they would justify this partly economically, but also doctrinally, they would say, you know, they want, uh, they want, to, be, they want to be able to lift their armies around the world uh, easier. So let's have light forces. And we've seen this with, um, uh, as recently as the 2000s, uh, or, or let's, let's say the, the 1990s going into the 2000s, where there was a, an argument about going towards uh, wheeled armored vehicles away from tracks, uh, lighter uh, and even modular armored vehicles. So if you did need more survivability, you could add on armor. And, that, and technically that always turns out to be a lot more difficult in practice than in theory. 
So, I mean, we've got this, this long cycle of history to learn from where usually the lightning suddenly hits an operation where you, you need heavier and belatedly you have to go heavier. And, and you know, in, in, that can be very expensive, as we saw in Iraq, for instance. And now you are urgently requiring MRAPs and other vehicles and, and more main, main battle tank deployments uh, with capacities that the, 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 for, the support and service capacities which you had not previously planned for in that operation. So are we in a danger of hitting that sort of, rough, that sort of historical cycle too? I think that's a really valid point. And again, this over-optimization seems to be like that that's a real risk, right? I would also, so I, I would hate to like find out, oh, great, great. We're like having to fight, you know, some, uh, heavy sort of needed, you know, ground forces stuff. I'd also hate to show up in the Pacific and need to be able to compete with China and find that we can't do it. We didn't make investments. We didn't make trade-offs. We didn't make changes. It would be really, my daughter is on the Ford. So my daughter's a sailor on the Ford. Um, I really don't want uh, that ship and all of those American sailors and Marines and all of that equipment uh, to be touched, you know, by a ten thousand dollar missile and gone. So I, I I I hear what you're saying. I really don't want to make the opposite, you know, mistake of not being creative and trying to think how do we meet different futures because one of those futures very credibly involves a massive loss of exclusive platforms, and I don't want to see that happen to Marines and sailors. Yeah. Thank you. So final thoughts, gentlemen. Great discussion. Thank you. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you very much for having me here. Appreciate the opportunity, Bruce, and uh, look forward to doing this again sometime in the future. Well, thank you all. I thank you for your military service, and I thank you for your public service in speaking today. So you're speaking to my students, and you're speaking to the public in general. So thank you for your time, and I appreciate a very erudite and interesting discussion. Thank you. I hope we have an opportunity to do this again. So thank you all. Hurrah. Hurrah. Thank you. Hurrah. Hurrah.